A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption through which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If only we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Verbum Domini. Our God is the God of salvation. Our God is the God of salvation. God arises, his enemies are scattered, and those who hate him flee before him. But the just rejoice and exult before God. They are glad and rejoice. Our God is the God of salvation. The Father of orphans and the Defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God gives a home to the forsaken. He leads forth prisoners to prosperity. Our God is the God of salvation. Blessed day by day be the Lord who bears our burdens, God who is our salvation. God is a saving God for us. The Lord, my Lord, controls the passageways of death. Dominus Fabiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelis Secundum Lucam. <clears throat> Jesus was teaching in a synagogue on the Sabbath, and a woman was there who for 18 years had been crippled by a spirit. She was bent over completely incapable of standing erect. When Jesus saw her, he called to her and said, Woman, you are set free of your infirmity. He laid his hands on her, and she at once stood up straight and glorified God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant that Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, said to the crowd in reply, There are six days when work should be done, Come on those days to be cured, not on the Sabbath day. The Lord said to him in reply, Hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his ass from the manger and lead it out for watering? This daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 years now, ought she not to have been set free on the Sabbath day from this bondage? When he said this, all his adversaries were humiliated, 
and the whole crowd rejoiced at all the splendid deeds done by him. Verbum Domini. We welcome all of our visitors from California. I've been with them the last couple of days up in Hansville, and they have today to come here to visit Irondale and the facilities here. And they heard this first story I wanted to tell uh, already yesterday, but for the benefit of our television audience, I also wanted to use it again today. And it was in our own local a diocesan newspaper here, The One Voice, a week or two ago. There's a story of a president of one of the Big Ten football powers who said something that he later regretted. And he said, in commenting on the fact that TCU, Texas Christian University, and Boise State were contending for the national football title last year, I guess it was, and commenting on how supposedly weak their schedule was and how strong their schedule was, he said, we do not play the little sisters of the poor. And, but this team actually ended up losing the Big Ten title to Wisconsin, who went to the Rose Bowl and lost to TCU, Texas Christian University. And so all of the uh, supporters of TCU then put billboards all over the area where this other team was. But the Little Sisters of the Poor commented on all of the comments made about that because this has been a term that's been used to show how poor a football team is. You know, they might say, you know, who are they going to play next? The Little Sisters of the Poor or that guy couldn't get traded to the Little Sisters of the Poor. And so the Mother Superior, Sister Mary Vincent of Saints Peter and Paul, home in Pittsburgh, commented on all of this talk about how poor a team was and referring to them playing the Little Sisters of the Poor. And she said, we've all heard the phrase. I always say two things in response. One, they've never played us. <laughs> and two, they can't beat us anyway, and that's the truth. They play football, and we tend to the poor and the elderly. They could never do that. And then later, she said, uh, such levels of loyalty and zeal for sports teams are a bit lost on us little sisters. But we do know a thing or two about teamwork. It takes a lot of it to manage 30 homes for the elderly across the United States in today's healthcare climate. We have plenty of most valuable players on our team. They are the dedicated staff, volunteers, lay associates, and benefactors who selflessly share in our mission of hospitality to the needy every day. The real stars of our team, however, are the elderly themselves. They are members of what has become known as the greatest generation, those who fought through the challenges of the Depression and World War II, and the silent generation which saw the birth of the atomic age. And now they have come to the Little Sisters of the Poor, seeking security, love, and respectful care in their old age because they can't quite make it on their own anymore. And so she is talking about, you know, what is it that really challenges us? It's giving of ourselves and charity. You know, playing a football team, then that's interesting. It, and it can bring about a growth and discipline and teamwork and so on and those virtues that are good. But what we're really called to is a life of charity, of self-giving. And in today's gospel, our Lord was not slow. He did not hesitate on helping this woman who had been stooped over for 18 years, even though he perhaps knew that he would get flack for doing this on the Sabbath but he realized and he knew that charity was not something forbidden on the Sabbath. In fact, Pope, blessed Pope John Paul II in his apostolic exhortation on the observance of Sunday says this very thing as well, that Sundays are a good day for us to do works of charity, to invite someone in need 
to our homes, and so on. So a question for us today is who is stooped over that needs to be helped up by us in our lives? Certainly the people that I described who are cared for by the Little Sisters of the Poor, they recognized these people who were stooped over, who needed care in their elderly uh, and infirm conditions, the elderly and the poor that they help. I think another group that needs to be lifted up today are children, our children. And I'd like to mention two initiatives that are especially helping uh, children to be lifted up from their stoop condition. You know, one third of children in our own country, the United States, will grow up without their fathers. And we know that there are many who are simply orphaned or abandoned throughout the world. And it was uh, this past spring, graduation time in college, that a family that I know, the De Filippis family, and I had blessed their home when they lived here in Birmingham. They're originally from Iowa. Now they live in Tennessee. But their, their daughter, Sarah Jo, De Philippus, De Phillips, uh, she recently graduated from the University of Tennessee. And she sent a letter about now what she's going to be involved in. And she is going to Honduras to work with this group called uh, Finca del Nino the farm of the child. And it's a, it's a group of uh, Hondurans, of Americans, doctors, a wonderful uh, community of religious women who live there, who help the orphaned and abandoned. As she said, it provides children with a home, a family, an education, and Christian formation. Uh, and they, what they have is something quite unique. It's a family-style orphanage. And so they'll actually have couples, Honduran couples, who live in these homes that are there. And the children then live in these homes, so it's more of a home environment. It's not you know, the, the sterile kind of environment. It's a warm home environment. There's parents there who see them all as their children, and they care for them. And so it's helping them then to become strong and healthy citizens eventually of their country. Uh, as she says, Honduras, where they are, they are it's, it's a beautiful country, but when you, when you look around, you also see it's the least developed nation, one of the least developed nations in Central America and the poverty that surra surrounds you. The violence, crime, substance abuse lead to weakened and destroyed families, as well as orphaned and abandoned children. So, these people recognized these children are all stooped over. They need to be helped up. They need to be lifted up. You know, what did St. Paul say in today's first reading? We are all children of God. Our spirit cries out, Abba, Father. And if it's one thing, one singular teaching that could lead to peace in the world, it is a recognition of the dignity of every human person. Of course, that's our Christian philosophy that every human person, whatever condition they might be, orphaned, abandoned, whatever handicap or difficulty they have, elderly, infirm, in need of constant care, but every person, our Christian philosophy, our Lord himself has taught us, has a dignity. And if we could recognize that simple truth, there would be peace in the world because we would seek to overcome injustices. We would seek to help those who have great needs, those who are hungry, would want to help and protect the unborn child. There's a wonderful initiative at work now of defining personhood for the unborn child. Because at the first moment of conception, there's a unique person there. He doesn't have the makeup, the uh, DNA makeup, the chromo chromosomal makeup of his mother. He's a unique individual, unique person. And if we def define that child in the womb as a person at the moment of conception, and then we recognize the human dignity of that child, then it will lead to our respecting that child and seeing to its um, fulfillment and uh, meeting all of its needs during its life. 
As I mentioned as well, another initiative that I wanted to talk about is that one third of the children in our own country grow up without their fathers. Some one million children this year will suffer the pain of divorce of their parents. And so you see this trouble within families and marriages and in fatherhood. Men unwilling to take responsibilities and tending to the children that they have begotten. And so there's a wonderful initiative by a, a church in uh, Georgia. They've made a number of films. And recently I went to see Courageous. Perhaps you've heard about the movie Courageous. I went with one of our EWTN workers here who has nine children actually. And we went to see uh, this movie at a local theater up in Coleman. And it's, it's a remarkable movie that I really would encourage every man to see and their wives with them too. That it's a, a wonderful film that puts before us the sad consequences of a fatherless society that we see in our own society around us, the increase in crime. Most of those who are in prison, the vast majority of them didn't have fathers or good father, uh, fathers with, uh, in their lives or someone that could mentor them as a father if they were lacking their own earthly father. And so it shows quite clearly the truth, the reality, that the breakdown of the family, a fatherless society, leads down to the breakdown of society as a whole and how important that, that role is. But it also then shows, conversely, the beauty of fulfilling one's role and vocation in their own fatherhood. So oftentimes, those that are stooped over are right in our own homes. And, you know, it's said in our society that the greatest need, uh, the, it, we live in a love-starved society, that people don't have those that care for them. Children don't have those who really care about them and want to see to their formation and to guide them throughout their lives. You know, one of the interesting things is at the end of the movie, and I'm not going to spoil the movie for you, but the credits. The credits, they have credits, they have a whole list of babysitters. And then they have a whole list of churches that uh, catered the meals because it's a very low budget movie, but at the same time, it was done extremely well. This group has done a number of others, and this one is by far the best uh, production that they have put together. And most importantly is that message that message that needs to be heard uh, loud and clear today. So today, we look at the, the church as an instrument, as I've said before, a treasury of God's compassion. And we're to be part of that treasury of compassion that reaches out to those, as our Lord did, to those who are stooped over, to help to lift them up in some way. Let us take to heart the needs of our dear children if they don't have the father in their life, maybe we can be a father to them in some way, that we can help to mentor them and help to guide them in some way. Those who may be infirm uh, or elderly, that maybe we can go to visit them uh, to give them some hope and some joy in their lives too. And what, when we do those things, then we're gonna find that we're gonna receive much more in return. May we all recognize that we are all children of God. We are all called to be heirs with Christ. And so all of us have this dignity that God has given us, this glory that he has prepared for us.